Hello there. Good Good evening. (laughs) Good evening, Tessa. How are you? Oh, it's good to be with you again. Well, it's good to be with you, and I love hearing your voice. I didn't read your bio yet. Would you like me to go ahead and do that? Yeah. It's a little I'm gonna long. Go ahead. I'm, I'll, I'm going to shorten it up a little bit, but I just want everybody to know that Tessa's with us tonight, Tessa B. Dick. And Tessa B. Dick began her writing career as a journalist, writing for magazines and newspapers. Her husband, Philip K. Dick, encouraged her to write fiction after he read her first story. Uh, she worked with him on his later novels, including Valis and A Scanner Darkly. Since then, Tessa has produced a variety of poems and stories, as well as a murder mystery and several memoirs. Two of her memoirs have been published in Italian translations, and her surrealist novel, The Darkening of the Light, is currently in the process of translation. Some of her shorter works can be found in the online magazine, PKD Otaku, and you can you can purchase all of her incredible books. We're going to get into all the books that she has available right now on Amazon.com. Um, and please welcome Tessa to the show this evening. That was kind of a short version, and, and so thank you and welcome. Oh, thank you. It's good to hear you, and of I hope you're not... I'm having a bit of a cough now that I'm on the air. Haven't oh, okay. coughed all day. That's, that's typical. That's the late night cough that we all get. You know, we might as well smoke cigars. You know. <laughs> oh, and uh, Jerry in the chat room, I was not listening on the phone. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not quite that senile. No, you're smart as a whip. Are you kidding me? And so, and so uh, by the way, what are you working on right now? Oh, the ex in exegesis. Okay. So, so let's, <laughs> let's elaborate on this. <laughs> yeah, let's unwrap that. Well, my late ex-husband, Philip K. Dick, left a monumental pile of thousands and thousands of pages of notes, which he called exegesis, and he never did put it into a final form, and I don't uh, presume to be able to do that myself, but I think I can condense it and make some sense out of it. And I've found that a lot of what he wrote really does center on the letter X, Hmm. like X files or the X in algebra, which is, of course, unknown. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. X marks the spot, huh? Yeah, it's actually the Greek letter. um, In English, we usually call it either chi or chi or or chi, and it, the Greeks wrote it as an X. Mm. And, uh, you know, Phil's a vision centered on the fish symbol. He had these visions. I'm just assuming the audience knows a little about him. Mm-hmm. Uh, They inspired his exegesis, and they centered on the early Christian symbol of the fish, which had a Greek word, the Greek word for fish, written inside a a drawing of a fish. And, yeah, the first letter is a little iota, but the second letter, which looks like an X, is the CH, which is the first letter of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, went very deeply into religions of all sorts in his exegesis, but he started from an Episcopalian uh, Christian viewpoint, and um, he was fond of pointing out that Jesus probably was not crucified on a cross shaped like the letter T but rather one shaped like the letter X, Mm. which was easier to build, easier to stand up, and much more common in ancient times. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it was, wasn't it Peter that was uh, crucified like that? I believe, yeah, he was crucified upside down at his own request. Mm Mm-hmm. And he said 
that uh, and Peter said that it was because he didn't deserve to be crucified right side up. Mm-hmm. But um, he probably really wanted to die a little faster. Mm. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Crucifixion is painful. Mm. Yeah, this is interesting. But there's no doubt about that one. Well, that sounds very interesting that you're working on this. I, I suspect it's going to take a while to to decode everything but oh, yeah even the oh approximately 300 pages of exegesis that have been published in the form of a book are, are quite a monumental task just to read mm-hmm. and um, i understand there's a second volume coming out mm-hmm. but I've, I've been looking at the actual the images of the actual handwritten pages that are on a website. Um, hmm. You have to join, but they let me join. Mm-hmm. Because the work of actually um, deciphering his handwriting and typing it out is still being done. And I'm getting pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. So do you have a lot anyway, of his old handwriting? I mean, do you, do you have a lot of his old work that's actually handwritten? Not anymore. I've um, sold off quite a few bits of memorabilia over the years to keep the bills paid. So I don't yeah. have much left. Mm-hmm. But that's okay because, you know, stuff happens. And if I had it all in one place, stuff could happen to all of it. Mm-hmm. True. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It, it, it's in the hands of people who appreciate it. Oh, of course. Yeah. Well, it's timeless. There's no doubt about that one. And it sounds like you're doing well, some, some awesome work with your own writing. I know you have a, you did your own uh, decoding of, of the Blade Runner. Oh, your analysis. I uh, did a lengthy <laughs> review of both movies um, and the book on which they were based, which is, of course, The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to type <laughs> and talk at the same oh. time. Oh, okay. in the chat. <laughs> yeah, and now my mouse is... See, I hate the mouse pad. I have an actual mouse because the pad mm-hmm. never does what I tell it to. But if I pass my hand over the uh, mouse pad without even touching it, it does stuff. Oh, there well, we go. It's got a mind of its own then. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, um, I've become convinced over the years that most of what uh, Phil described as visions in 1974 mm-hmm. was really the result of an electromagnetic attack. Mm-hmm. I always suspected it, but um, in particular, there's a book by Robert Duffy called Camellio. Mm-hmm. It's like yep. chameleon without the N. Right. And he, he actually found Um, real evidence of such a technology existing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been around for a while. Yeah, I I think I sent you a documentary of what happened to me. So yeah, that's definitely for real. It's interesting because if he was in uh, 1974, that was supposed to have been an early, earlier version of the warfare program, which might have been really brutal to some degree. Either a prototype or an early model of Mm -hmm. what the CIA calls the voice of God. Mm -hmm. But there were also um, images projected. Yep. Not just into Phil's mind. Because I sometimes caught glimpses out of the corner of my eye. Mm -hmm. And I used to think it was just because Phil had described them so vividly. But I think now maybe these were crude um, holograms. Mm-hmm. That sounds like it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure he was being tracked and surveilled to some degree when it comes down to it. 
Yeah, we talked about his, can, his brilliant. Go ahead. Yeah, I can say why now. Oh, when I look and see what he's been writing. <laughs> I mean, most of his well, writing seems like, go ahead. <laughs> it, it's more than that because, you know, before I met him, he had all kinds of trouble in 1971, which culminated in his house being ransacked. Fortunately, no one was home at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really destroyed. And he never could figure out why. But I, I think I put it together because at the time that Phil had all this trouble, Dr. Timothy Leary, the LSD doctor, had escaped from prison. And he was on the most wanted list. Well, before that, but not long before that, Dr. Leary had actually telephoned Phil from a bed-in with John Lennon and Yoko Ono in Montreal. Oh, jeez. And, you know, I'm sure Phil's phone was not bugged at the time, but I'm sure they had a tap on John Lennon's phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when they were trying to find people in Northern California who might be helping Timothy Leary, <clears throat> Phil's name popped up. He lived in Northern California and he had had contact with Dr. Leary, who was a wanted man. Mm hmm. Wow, that's very wow. interesting. I didn't realize he escaped from prison. Jeez. Yeah, uh, they claimed that the um, weather underground or maybe the Black Panthers broke him out of the prison. Mm. It, I had been under the impression that he escaped San Quentin, but I got that wrong. He had been sent to San Quentin because he escaped from minimum security. And oh. apparently someone helped him because, uh, you know, his prison clothes were dumped in a restroom at a gas station. Someone brought him clothing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very interesting. So when they ransacked Phil's house or your house in 1971, what was, did, was anything stolen? Was anything removed? Okay, I didn't know Phil at the time I met okay. him in 72, but uh, valuables were left behind. They mm -hmm. took his bank records and some of his manuscripts, but they didn't take cash or an expensive watch. Mm -hmm. They did dump all his food out of the refrigerator, mm -hmm. just dropped it on the kitchen floor. Weird. Well, the fact that they took his manuscripts is interesting. Oh, yeah. One novel, he didn't have another copy, and he never tried to rewrite it. The other one, he had sent a copy to his lawyer, so that was blow my tears, the policeman said. They took Phil's carbon copy, but his lawyer had the original. Mm. Interesting. That's very yeah. suspect. That's that's just well, definitely he's a high target of interest, in my opinion, anyway. And it sounds like he yeah. was definitely being inter interfaced with a technological um, program of some kind. Sure so was. Mm hmm. Makes you wonder. Well, I, would, would, I was affected, but I didn't have visions. Mm -hmm. but uh, my sleep was disturbed, and I had the weirdest dreams. Mm hmm yeah. yeah. That sounds like you were being messed with, if you ask me. Just from the signature alone, I mean, because I, I know what the technological workings are about mm -hmm. insofar as how it feels, so very, very interesting nonetheless. You know, when he transferred out, um, was he cremated, or, or did he have a normal type of a funeral? No, um... He was cremated. There wasn't room in the grave for a coffin. You know, his father had purchased a grave 
when his twin sister died as an infant, and it's a double grave for the two of them. Mm-hmm. So he's buried next to his sister, Jane, in Fort Morgan, Colorado. Mm-hmm. Right. I got That's to go there two years ago and see it in person. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you got to come out here. You know, it's interesting. I, I always wondered why, I, I get why he was cremated, but at the same time, it's just, I don't know. It seems like that's the easiest way to get rid of evidence. If, if he has been implanted or tampered with, then it's easier to, to get rid of evidence when you cremate you know, someone. Well, my best guess is that when he went to the dentist, they inserted something while they were extracting his tooth. Because mm-hmm. that's when it started, was when he came home from the dentist, uh, the oral surgeon. Hmm, that's interesting. And sometimes they can just interface with a signal, so you don't even need a, a chip or anything like that. But I heard in the old days they used to use things like that with a with a dental. So that's that's very interesting. And you did have yeah, a few breakdowns. I, I mean, it seems like it was overwhelming, whatever was going on with them. Well, yeah, it was disturbing, but then another voice came in. At first, you know, all the voices were telling him to die, to kill himself, and then this other voice came in, a woman's voice telling him that he was a good person who deserved to live and that she would help him. Hmm. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. Was that before or after he wrote uh, Blade Runner or Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Oh, after. He wrote that in 69, or he published it in 69. And Mm -hmm. the visions were in 74. So that's interesting. Um, People get confused about the dates and they finally settled on February and March. He did have the oral surgery in February, Mm -hmm. but he settled on the date of the 2nd of March because that's when the infamous Xerox letter arrived. Hmm. He was sure that it was some kind of coded message and he he didn't know what it meant, but he was pretty sure that Somewhere in his unconscious, he'd been instructed. Hmm. Oh, that's wild. A Xerox letter, huh? Oh, no. He tried suicide in Canada a few months before I met him. Hmm. Um, He hadn't really any clear memory. He just woke up sitting on the floor of his apartment in Vancouver with an empty bottle of sleeping pills next Mm. to him. At the time, you could get potassium bromide without a prescription. Mm -hmm. It's also known as a date rape drug. Mm. Right. Well, his memories, as he said in a speech in Metz, France, his memories began coming back. Two men in black suits had grabbed him off the street, shoved him into the back of a limousine, and driven him around. And they were talking to him and asking him questions. Hmm. And they told him to kill himself. They wow. used drugs on him and hypnotized him and told him to kill himself. And he almost succeeded. Okay. But when he when he became conscious and saw what he'd done, he called for help. Mm-hmm. It sounds like they had him programmed to some degree or hypnotized. Yeah, definitely. So how did he snap out of that? He, he obviously remembered it, though. Did he just kind of switch gears and deprogram? Well, I don't know how he snapped out of it. I wasn't there. I hadn't met him yet. He just woke up and decided to call for help. Wow. Some serious stuff going on. 
he's still, um, yeah, there, he had a, um, a sort of a waking dream in which the, uh, I, I guess I'll call her Sophia, the female voice that helped him, told him it was the bromide. But at that point, he didn't connect it with anything he hadn't remembered yet. And mm-hmm. I was thinking maybe Bromo seltzer, because he pictured his grandmother pulling a blue and white box out of the cupboard when he had a tummy ache. Mm-hmm. But now I'm thinking she was telling him it was the potassium bromide, mm-hmm. the sleeping Did, pills that he took. Right. When he had that communication, was it nonstop, 24 hours a day? No. No? No. It would be in quiet moments when he was alone. He took a lot of naps and... His friends and I all thought he was malingering, not really ill. Mm-hmm. But uh, his his children inherited the same problem. It's a defect in the pancreas and the gallbladder that makes you feel like you have the flu. Mm-hmm. And Bill would say he had the flu and people thought he was just weaseling out of things, canceling appointments and telling people not to come over to visit. Mm-hmm. Even his uh, psychiatrist thought he was making it up. But he wasn't, right? Right. Did they ever resolve that, that health issue or no? No, we never... Figured it out while Phil was alive. I just knew that he seemed actually ill. Mm-hmm. So I, I eventually accepted that whatever was going on, he was really ill. Mm-hmm. But he wouldn't go to the doctor. <laughs> Don't blame him. He and I both grew up with parents who didn't take you to the doctor unless they couldn't stop the bleeding. <laughs> I think that was the way it was. Just, you know. <laughs> Back yeah. in the day. Yeah. Well, that right. makes sense. Well, nowadays, or if you go to the hospital, it's tetanus. dangerous. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Or if you needed a tetanus shot. Right. Well, there's some wisdom to that because doctors' offices and hospitals are full of sick people mm-hmm. and they're contagious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> extremely, uh, extremely, extremely. Especially yeah. nowadays. Mm hmm. I don't. I don't oh, like but. doctors. <laughs> yeah, I think you're better off not going to the hospital unless it's absolutely critical. But yeah, by the time you get there, it's too oh, late yeah. anyway. Usually, yeah. I I walked out of an emergency room once because the nurse. I I had a, a an injured foot. He wasn't wearing gloves when he took the bandages off my foot to look at it. Mm-hmm. And then he went to the next patient without washing his hands. Mm. So I got up and walked out, bloody foot Mm -hmm. and all. Oh, gosh. Yeah. They actually threatened to drag me back in. I won. Oh, good for you. They called a security guard, and then an actual cop came by. And I just said, they wanted to make me a 5150, you know, crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And I just said, you're incompetent and you're not treating me. I'm going to another hospital. And I I'm won. Well, I don't blame you on that. Yeah, they're getting really lazy. What year was this? Was this recent? Um, I think it was 10 years ago. Okay. I'm sure they're worse now. Seems I'm like not getting really bad. clear on recent dates anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I, um... I had a head, oh, it was 07, I just remembered. About 10 years ago, I had a head injury. I slipped and fell on the ice, Mm -hmm. cracked my skull, had a serious concussion. And so things are a little hazy. Mm -hmm. Kidding, that's dangerous. 
No kidding. In fact, about a year later, I was just walking in my own backyard and broke my leg, and I don't know how. So I'm much more careful now. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Are you still seeing that spirit? You said you used to see a ghost in your yard. Do you still see her? From time to time. Mm-hmm. Um, it might be just a trick of the light because I have these greenhouse windows that extend out and it might be a reflection of someone on the street. Mm-hmm. But I get the feeling that it really is someone walking through the rose garden. Mm-hmm. She isn't yeah. scary or anything. Right. But it's, I don't. I, I don't find that like interesting. to go there. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. I mean, you can get awfully woo-woo about it, and I mm-hmm. know that psychic phenomena are real, mm-hmm. but they're also dangerous. True. If you don't, if you don't know what you're doing, you can get in big trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. No, it just was interesting, and- though. And sometimes, even if you do know, (laughs) you'll get in trouble. Yeah, I've learned to listen to that still, small voice that says, now, wait a minute, don't don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's good. If I don't listen, I end up being sorry. (laughs) Right. Well, you're fairly analytical. You seem very grounded. Oh, thank you. I and intelligent. Try. I know you are. Yeah. Well, I don't. Go ahead. I was going to say your books are on Amazon.com. Or... Yes. Go my ahead. grandparents grew up on the farm, and my parents grew up in the Depression. So, you know, mm-hmm. I'm kind of a pragmatic American. Mm-hmm. If it works, use it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Yeah, but, times have changed yeah. too. The world's the world seems like we're in a time machine. Yeah. Well, I I'm more and more convinced that time is not real. Mhm. I agree. Yep. And and so has had this thing about orthogonal time. Mhm. So in his mind, the world of Blade Runner is in a sense real. But it's really, at its basis, a metaphor for slavery. Mm-hmm. Yep. These uh, androids, he, he calls them robots at some point, but they're organic. You yep. can't tell them from a human except that they lack empathy. Mm-hmm. So his android hunting cop is confused when... Uh, Rachel shows no empathy, but her uncle says she's human. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. But so these androids are slaves who want their freedom. Mm hmm. Exactly. Well, and then you know, there's the neural interface, which is an enslavement program, too, because the synthetic telepathy program that interfaces a person, a target, will actually enslave their thought forms. So it's very interesting. I, I mean, that's that's where I've been with synthetic telepathy. That's why I can say it's a parallel. Sometimes when I when I see things like Blade Runner, I can totally understand uh-huh. where he's coming from. He was way ahead of his time. I mean, my goodness, I think he knew that. But yeah. unbelievable. I, I've never met anything. I've never seen anything like him. Quite honestly, uh, he was he was definitely a legend. He's no doubt about it. Definitely unique and still affecting our world. More than ever, in fact. Yep. But you know, as good as the 1982 Blade Runner was, it didn't really capture the whole picture of what's in the novel. Mm-hmm. With the um, great loss of of um, not only the animals, but that the Earth is depopulated. Mm-hmm. When I watch the movies, I'm going, 
Where did all those people come from? Right. Yeah. We should supposed to be wiped out by nuclear war. Mm-hmm. And the streets are crowded. That's true, isn't it? In the book, entire apartment complexes are vacant. Mm-hmm. I wonder why they changed yeah. that. Oh, I suppose it was more Ridley Scott's vision than Phil's. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like- I really tear apart the recent movie, the, the sequel. Because mm-hmm. I, I watched it, even the first time I watched it, I was shouting, continuity, <laughs> over and over. It, the biggest one was when Love, the uh, bad android, goes to the police station to use their computer to find Officer K. Mm-hmm. Well, they've already established that Officer K wiped his hard drive so the police cannot find him. And that he's carrying a portable device that allows love to find him without any help. Mm-hmm. So it's a flaw. <laughs> That's the big one. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, they just needed to have a gruesome, brutal murder scene. <laughs> you know? Right. That's they got to have their car chases, explosions, and blood and gore and guts. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny because I didn't even see the new one. I didn't want to see it because I like the old one so much. Mm. Am I missing well, I anything? Well, okay, after two hours, they finally bring in uh, Indiana Jones. <laughs> I've forgotten his name again. Oh, Harrison Ford. Yeah. But it's too little too late. Mm-hmm. He was wonderful in the first film. Oh, yeah, he was awesome. Yep. Great cast. Yeah. Great cast, yeah. Now, if this film were edited... Uh, you know, and shortened three hours. Three hours. That's, that's counting twenty minutes of closing credits. That's well, ridiculous. Go ahead. Uh, the landscapes are spectacular. I love the music, but after two hours with nothing happening, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, it's it's overkill. I realize that, that the director, Denis Villeneuve, is an artiste, mm-hmm. but three hours? That's ridiculous. With no intermission for people to use the restroom and buy more popcorn? <laughs> you go to sleep in two hours. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so who wrote the script? Him having intermission. Mm-hmm. I think that even Lord of the Rings, when I watched that, it was just too much for me. I love the movie. I thought it was beautiful, but I, I just can't sit for that long. This is ridiculous. But yeah, I who wrote the script for that? The DVD. Uh-huh. <laughs> Same reason. I saw the first one in the theater. In fact, I think it was at, at the college. I think they showed it for free. <laughs> well, but nice. uh, for the next two... I don't know, were there three or four? Anyway, I bought them all on DVD. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Funny. And I watched, I watched part one of The Hobbit in the theater. Mm-hmm. Walk, 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 fight. Walk, 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 fight. <laughs> walk, walk, walk. Ooh, look, a dragon. The end. Yeah. Do you remember the rough back she went? Back for part two. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Do you remember the animated one with Ralph Bakshi? That was a real long one. For, uh, oh, I don't Lord think of the Rings. I've ever seen it. Oh, it was good. Yeah, it was before this other Lord of the Rings, you know, the remake. It was it was very good with Bakshi did that one. Gosh, I don't remember what year it was. But that was a nice animated version. It's a real long one, though. Yeah. yeah. I do like good animation, like the old Disney before they quit paying for real artists to draw Mm -hmm. things. Yeah, it's changed a lot, hasn't it? It's more like Hanna-Barbera than Disney now. Mm -hmm. 
I was going to ask you with this new Blade Runner, uh, ser- the new one, who wrote the script for that then? Hampton Fancher. Okay. So why does he have permission to do that? I mean, it's kind of like hijacking. Well, yeah. Okay. He wrote the script for the first one, but then for for the 1982 film, they brought in a script doctor named David Peoples. Hmm. And he, he still hated Sancher's screenplay. Mm-hmm. He liked what David Peoples did with it. And Peoples has been very generous in praising Fancher, but you, he wasn't there for the new film, the sequel, and you can tell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's interesting. But they're still making a name. They're still making money. At, do you get any percentage at all? Because it's, it's all no. Phil's work. You know, isn't that interesting? I, I never should have signed the divorce papers. <laughs> no kidding. But even what I was entitled to from the settlement has turned out to be very little mm-hmm. and not much help. Right. It just seems like they took advantage of him. It seems like he didn't get the credit he really needed when he was alive. And then when he when he transferred out, it seems like they've really capitalized off of his work. So. Well, Hollywood is making out well, and the lawyers mm-hmm. are really making out well. Yeah. <laughs> and Phil's so, yeah. daughter, Issa, is doing well, but she works hard. She she is a producer on most of these um, uh, films, and, and, of course, the uh, Man in the High Castle series. Mm. Oh, good. But, if you look into Electric Dreams, uh, quite a few of the stories they use are in public domain. Mm-hmm. So wow. they don't have to pay for them. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. There, there isn't a lot of money mm-hmm. left. And I'm not entitled to any of it anymore. Uh, uh, they bought me out. Mm. That's a bummer. Well, certainly well, is a lot of incredible information. There's no doubt. Yeah. All of his works. It was works. better than fighting about things. Yeah. I can imagine. It can become yeah. very, very toxic. Anyway. Yeah, a lot of yeah. good work. But, yeah, I noticed that all your books are on Amazon. Is that the only location that you have them on is Amazon, or are they someplace else, too? Well, they should be available uh, on Barnes & Noble and some okay. other sites. I think one's on Smashwords, but I never get any money from them. The only one that has actually been paying me is Amazon. Yeah, Amazon's gotten better, I must say, about paying authors. The the other sites have a minimum. On Mm -hmm. Amazon, if I make a dollar, they pay me. Right. Two months later, but I, you know, in the old (laughs) days, with a... Brick and mortar publisher, you didn't get paid for a year or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty interesting how that rolls. But you have some murder yeah. mysteries too. You're still writing the murder mysteries or no? Well, I have one available. It's called Murder Lies. The murder takes place in Denver. Naturally. But the the um, <laughs> woman the just coincidence. I thought it was a great place to locate a copper mine. Oh, yeah. Anyway, nice. um, the woman detective lives in Twin Peaks with her cat. Mm-hmm. Very the real Twin Peaks in the San Bernardino Mountains. Uh-huh. Very Near nice. Lake oh. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I have several memoirs. Uh, There's conversations with Philip K. Dick and Philip Mm -hmm. K. Dick remembering Firebright, which focuses more on his visions, his pink light experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have some great stuff out there. Thank you. you I really need to get the sequel to my murder mystery finish. Mm-hmm. It has it has vampires. Oh, really? So you're working yes. on that right now, right? Yeah. 
I'd like to read that one. <laughs> I have to put aside the exegesis from time to time and work on the murder mystery. <laughs> it's easier to talk about blood and gore. Oh, gee. I'm not going to ask about the woman in the van outside, but never mind. We'll talk about that off air. But, oh, um... <laughs> she's gone. Oh, good. She's gone, okay. but she's within a block. Mm-hmm. Uh... Well, when she heard the tow truck was coming, she moved her vehicle. Oh, that's good. Yeah, saved me three hundred dollars. Yeah, I was gonna say plenty of vampires in your neighborhood. Oh, go ahead. We have a homeless problem up here. No, we do too. It's everywhere. Maybe she'll be in the murder mystery. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. One of the vampires. Anyway, um, yeah. You know, she was crashing at a friend's house and renting out her van to other homeless people. Well, that's that's interesting. That's an entrepreneur right there. Yeah, well, she saved up enough to rent a room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. We'll see how long that lasts. Mm-hmm. So anyway. All right, so you are working on the murder mystery with the vampires. Right. Okay. And uh, my woman sleuth is going to find that she really is psychic. You see, she was originally a phony psychic with a crystal ball and everything. Mm -hmm. She got tired of being a phony and decided to be a real detective. Mm. But she's going to find that she really is psychic. A psychic detective. Sounds good. Mm-hmm. Well, let us know yeah. when that comes out, because I'd like to read that one. That sounds very intriguing. Oh, thank you. Have you read Murder Lies? You know, I haven't. Uh, I have to read it. Oh. So, yes, I'm behind on my reading. But I am going to read it. Uh-huh. Now, I was going to ask you also, now you do have a cookbook. This is older, but it's the cookbook for The Kitchen Challenged. Yeah, I'll buy the kitchen challenge. Okay. <laughs> what sparked it, that? It just has a few recipes, but they're easy things that even I can make nice. successfully. That's cute. And I most saw that. People, most people love the instructions for coleslaw. Ooh, that sounds good. It's yeah. a little more time consuming than just throwing some mayonnaise into shredded cabbage, but mm-hmm. it's totally worth it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds good. And that's over there on Kindle, if I'm not mistaken. So that's kind of yeah. nice. Yeah, Kindle's pretty good. Uh, mo- most of my books are on Kindle. Mm-hmm. And I've had some problems with people cracking the code. And I usually allow sharing anyway. But mm-hmm. I don't want other people selling my books. Mm-hmm. So I right. usually wait wait till the paperback's been out a while before I put it on Kindle. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a good idea. Yeah. That's that's excellent. Well, hurry up and finish that book. Get that, get that work in there. And are you editing at all? I know I was going to send you some of my, um, some people who have wanted some editors, but you're not editing books or no? Well, I can do some editing. It's just such a busy time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, We have to create, you know, I'm on a mountain in a forest. We have to create defensible space Mm -hmm. around our property every spring. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I tried to get someone to help, but she doesn't listen. Mm. When I ask someone to Rake the leaves and bag them up. I don't expect her to start deciding which of my things she's going to throw away because I'm a pack rat. (laughs) I'm not paying for for that. Right. Well, I'm a bit of a pack rat, but people have no idea how much crap I throw out every Mm -hmm. week. Oh, you're always having a sale or something. I noticed you've been, you know, now and then, right? I have yard sales and I throw mm-hmm. out the absolute trash and, you know, I, 
between the head injury and the broken leg, I never caught up when uh, three houses worth of stuff got thrown into one house because um, my rental property got foreclosed and my son's house got foreclosed in the crash. Mm. I used to be doing okay until the renters couldn't pay. Mm-hmm. And uh, things were so bad, I guess I'm pretty soft. I let them stay until the um, the people, who, the bank that foreclosed paid them $2,000 to move out. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, at least I didn't have to maintain the utilities for them. Mm-hmm. I said, that, you're on your own <laughs> for that. I'm kidding. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, it was just awful. Mm-hmm. And I like the house I've got, and I'm hoping to hang on to it. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah it sounds like a nice little place. To- yeah, if anybody wants to help out, they can go to my blog. <laughs> and that's Tessa Dick at blogspot.com, right? No, no. Oh, it's not that's it? My other, that's my other blog. Okay. The main one is PKD, you know, like Philip K. Dick. Mm-hmm. PKD Memoir, M E M O I R, mm-hmm. dot blogspot. Dot com. Okay. The other blog is um, more promotional for, um, well, I do some book reviews. I just copy and paste some press releases that I get that are related to literature. Mm-hmm. And I promote Swag Bucks, which is just a fun site that ding, once in a while I get an Amazon gift card for, you know, taking surveys and watching ads. Uh-huh. What, what about the uh, book? You say you do the book reviews. What kind of books do you review? Um, well, let's see. I reviewed Camellio. Oh, that's a great one. And Cryptoscatology, also Excellent. by Robert Duffy. That was the first book of his that I read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's awesome. Uh, he's it's, been on my show. It's, yeah, it's about um, propaganda and kind of verges on mind control. Mm-hmm. You know, like television. Yeah, <laughs> I, do, I haven't had television in. Oh, 12 years now, I think, and I don't miss it. No, I don't I don't have a TV either. I use my computer for whatever I need. I have a TV set for uh, the VCR and the DVD player. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, I can't ever get rid of it because it takes two men to pick it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it has tubes. Oh, wow. It has a picture tube. Well, I yeah. think I know that. Yes, but it's the one that I can hook up a VCR to. Oh, well, that's good. So you can watch your own thing. It has the right connectors. These mm-hmm. new TVs don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. true. So hang on to it. Yeah. It Jurassic Park. It keeps working. And Mm -hmm. I still have a few videos, you know, the tape. Mm -hmm. Oh, VHS? Yeah. I never did get a beta match, couldn't afford one. Mm -hmm. I have a working VCR. Well, that's good. I guess they work. They still work, right? Yeah. So I'd use them. Yep. My DVD player doesn't record, but it plays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah, I grew up in the dark ages. The phone <laughs> was bolted to the wall in the kitchen. Right. Times have changed, haven't they? 
And then Amazing. you had to turn the dial to to call someone. Right? Yeah, I remember the old fashioned phones. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. The times have changed, I'm telling you. It's just really strange how how uh, generations turn, you know, and so far as technology goes. And then there's the covert yeah. stuff, the other stuff, you know, then that gets mixed in. So it's very, very interesting. You know, we're almost out of time here mm-hmm. in, in about, I guess, the illusion of a few minutes here, plus or minus maybe two minutes. But if anybody wants to reach out to you, we're going to make sure I put that in the chat room, your your blog spot, so people can reach out to you if you, uh, if you want to help Tessa, oh. Tessa out. That's pkdmemoir.blogspot.com, right? Is your chat room allow links? Oh, it looks like it I think, does. I think it does. Yeah. yeah. It does. I put a few in there, so it's it's holding those. Yeah, it, it's holding the uh, YouTube. Yeah, you're still in chat, aren't you, Tessa? Um, Denise was asking what your favorite yeah. book to read was. What's your favorite book to read? Oh my God, <laughs> The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. Hmm. I'm trying to type now. It begins most people hate it because they can't figure out what's happening in the first chapter, but that's Listen, what I love sure about it. Mm-hmm. It starts with Bendy who is uh, mentally disabled and autistic. And he's watching men play golf. And what you hear is a stream of consciousness, his thoughts about it. That's interesting. The family has sold Genji's pastor to pay the bills. And it was where Benji had kept his pony that Benji would ride. And and Tessa? Every day. Tessa, we're out of time. Radio. We're just out at Never break sleeps. Break sleeps. I want to thank you for being on the show tonight. It's awesome to have you on. And I want to thank you for being on the show tonight. It's awesome to have you on. Stay tuned for Shining Side Out. Revolution Radio is supported 100% by you, and the listeners. Thank you, Kent. And that's why we appeal to you I to donate I... and support this station and its expenses. You can support us in many available options like archive subscriptions, our seed pack selections, or even my woodworking store. And we also even have Revolution Radio's swag at the Revolution Radio Zazzle store, which you can get t-shirts coffee cups even a baby onesie or you can just plain donate to the cause we cannot continue without your support and your support is what helps pay the bills so please if you wish us to continue please stop by our station support page and drop a dime on us revolution radio where information never sleeps data safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? In survival, in gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed?